How are you guys? Nice. Well, my name's Pastor Rick. Glad to be here with you guys. We have been journeying through the first four chapters of Galatians, talking a lot about law and law and grace. But chapter five is here. And so we get to talk about liberty tonight. It's been a great letter. You know what's happening is there were these Judaizers that were um, sneaking in after Paul had left. And, and he had just like laid down the gospel of grace. And these Judaizers sneak in there. And they were trying to say, that's good. That's great that you guys are saved by grace. But you know what? You got to work for it. So let's all form a line and you all start getting circumcised and stuff. <laughs> it's like, what? And then they're like, let me tell you about Sabbath and all these rules you need to follow. And Paul's like, what is happening? And so he authors this super strong letter to the Galatians. And he's like, what happened to you guys? It's never been about the law. The law's purpose was to point you toward Jesus. Man, that, and Jesus, what does he do? He's the one that fixes sin. He's the one that repairs your life. He's the one that is the light of the world. The law's job is to reveal the sin. It's Jesus's job to fix it. So uh, we have this amazing letter that we've been going through. Tonight, we find ourselves in Galatians chapter 5. So if you would, join me in chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse 1. So let's see what Paul has to say as we go through the first few verses. So he tells the Galatians in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. Let's stop there and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for liberty found in Jesus Christ. Lord, we wish to see Jesus tonight. We wish to be set free from bondages of sin and depression and anxiety and everything that's holding us back to, to the things that you have in store for us, God. So teach us tonight and help us to apply these truths to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, like I was trying to give you guys some context. Back in the first century, these Judaizers snuck in there while Paul, the good shepherd who had been just sharing Christ with all these people, he'd been sharing how they can be forgiven of all sins, how they could have new life in Jesus Christ. He leaves and these guys slide in there. They wait for the guy to leave and then they go in there. This is what I have titled punks. <laughs> they slide in there when the guy, the keeper's gone and they want to weasel their way in. So Paul's writing to his flock and he's like, he calls them foolish Galatians. Who's bewitched you? Who put a spell on you guys? In the last few weeks, as we've been going over uh, these chapters 1 through 4, we've been seeing how Paul says, like, it's never been about law. It's always been about Jesus and grace. 
these Judaizers wanted um, these people that were free in grace and enjoying a free life in grace, they wanted them to turn back and start following rules and regulations. These guys have been set free by Christ, he says. They're no longer in bondage. So why go back to those trappings? Why not just enjoy that relationship? We just celebrated Valentine's Day, right? But how weird would these relationships have been is if when you started the romance, someone would have busted out like a contract and said, here's all the do's and don'ts that I would like you to follow. Pick me up at this time. Once a month, we would have this time set aside for this. This is how you sacrifice to me this. And they had all these rules. How weird would that be? As opposed to just enjoying a growing relationship, right? And so Paul's been painting this picture. Like, guys, why are you trying to go back to this the set of rules that you've been set free from, that Jesus fulfilled? You know how many rules there were? Biblically, there were 613 rules. That's a lot of rules to follow. But the rules needed the Talmud, which was the thousands of oral traditions on how to follow the law. Paul's like, no way, you've been set free by Christ. That stuff is exhausting and limited. It's already served its purpose. It's revealed the sin. Now what we need to do is enjoy the relationship we have with Jesus Christ by just believing in him and allowing him to just work in and through your life. Paul's hammering tonight. You've been set free. You've been set free. There's liberty in Christ. As we move through these next uh, 15 verses... We see that the first chunk, the first like six or so verses, they show us that true liberty comes from God. Not by how much you can work for it. It comes from God. So let's look at verse one. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has, been, has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Again, Christ has set us free. So he says, stay free pretty simple stay free don't get all tangled up again christ has freed us why so we can enjoy all the benefits of freedom so we're supposed to be firm in this freedom so we don't become slaves again going back to this relationship with our schoolmaster as he put it with our tutor or as we saw last week with the bondwoman, the law. We don't need to go back to that. Paul's comparing the law to a yoke of slavery, he says. Okay, let's talk about yokes. Yokes, that doesn't mean yoked, like get yoked out. No, what he's saying is yokes, like a, like a horse thing. Like what they would put on an ox that would, he, would, he would pull. He'd be under the control of the master the whole time. It was heavy, it was hard work. Um, right now, yokes, what we see in the Bible is they represent slavery, work, service. We get a glimpse of it way back in, if we look back at the stories in, in Egypt, when God delivered Israel from Egyptian servitude, he said he was breaking the breaking of a yoke back there in Leviticus 26. This farmer puts the heavy yoke on the oxen so he can control the oxen. Man, it's, we've been set free. Regarding yokes, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come to me, Jesus said. Not go back to how can I, how can I do this? How can I work this up? I have to, I have to be better. I have to. No, come to me, Jesus said. All, all, everyone who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus is saying this. And here's why. He says this. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. Anybody need to find rest for their souls or am I the only one? Go to Jesus. Jesus. We have this liberty in Christ. In his own words, he's asking you, come to me, come to me. It's light. You got heavy ladens upon you? Come to Jesus. 
And he's saying that, so if you want to go and highlight it or memorize that, that's from Matthew eleven twenty eight. Paul says, Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. I love it. Paul's a straight shooter, simple and direct. If you add anything to the cross to try to obtain right standing with God, you are not saved. Because Jesus' work on the cross is enough. It was enough. Once for all. Sin, all, everything. What's all mean? All. Everything. It means everything. The believer is no long, longer under the law. He's under grace. Isn't that cool? If you're unfamiliar with the term of grace, think of it. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Oh, I hope he doesn't start talking cheap grace around here. Well, let me tell you, it's not cheap. It costs Jesus everything, his life. And, but it's free to us who are willing to receive it. <clears throat> There's liberty in Jesus. What is, does this liberty, liberty is this other word for freedom, where does this, where, what does this lead to? What kind of a life does it lead to? You know what a life in liberty leads to with Jesus? It leads to like a life that's like a thank you life. Thank you, Jesus. A want to life. Lord, I want to do these things. Not, oh, Lord, you're making me. No, I want to do this. Rather than a have to life, which is what the law leads to, a have to life. We're saved. Our faith in Jesus makes us children of this inheritance. Man, we have the richest dad in the whole world. Man, he invented money. He invented everything. He invented eternity where there's no more pain, no more despair, no more wickedness, no more famine, no more COVID, no more shutdowns, no more fill in the blank. There's no more of that. It's just worship with the Lord. It's, it's heaven. And we get that as our inheritance. When you believe in God, in, when you believe in Jesus, you have the right to become children of God. That's what John told us. It's only by believing in the work of Jesus Christ that our eternal addresses are changed by the grace of God. Because we are saved, Ephesians tells us, the Bible tells us, by grace through our faith. Not the law, but through faith. Can't work for it. That's how you get the law out of there. That, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 kicks the law right out. You are saved by grace through faith, not of works, should no man boast. It's a gift, it says. Verse 3 says, And I testify again, I'm saying this again, to every man who becomes circumcised, he is a debtor to keep the whole law. The whole law, you got to keep it all. Some of you know I used, to, I used to work for the police department when I was a kid. I can say that now because that was like 22 years ago <laughs> for me. And so I remember one time we, 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 uh, my training officer pulled this person over totally blowing a stop sign near a school on the north side here in town and they say why don't you go and catch real criminals it's like well I mean I get what he was saying but that's the whole law like I get that he was talking about murderers and stuff but he blew the stop sign and that's what it's like like if you're going to start following the law you better follow all of the law every single piece of it if you're going to go back to rule keeping, you got to do every rule. James tells us, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, one, has become accountable for all of it. So Paul is, he's, he's kind of been saying this throughout his letter. And he's saying, man, if you guys are going to go back to the law, you better get ready to do all of it. Grace has sounded good right about this time, huh? Saved by grace through faith. Free blessings that we don't deserve, but he gives it to us because he likes us, he loves us. Grace sounds really good. The law can kick rocks. Verse four. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Justified means just as if I had never sinned. You believe in Jesus Christ? Lord, forgive me of my sins. Boom, God justifies you. He declares you not guilty. That's what the word justification means. You are, it's just as if you had never sinned. Boom. 
your life with Christ until you meet him in eternity, your life with him, that's sanctification. The, process, the lifetime process of God separating us unto himself, making us more like Jesus Christ. That's what sanctification is for all those theology students out there. And so I wanted to explain that when that word justified pops out because it's a cool thing. Jesus does that for us when we believe in him. It's just as if we had never sinned before. But it says here, this is kind of interesting. So this kind of got me studying for a while. You have fallen from grace. Can I lose my salvation? Well, that's a big question that a lot of people like to argue about. Fallen from grace is not a reference to losing salvation or to salvation. It's not. Fallen, epikipto, I practice it. You know, I usually beat up the Greek words up here. But, oh my gosh, epikipto, epikipto. To be driven off course. That's what he's saying. To be driven off course. Okay, to fall from grace is not losing grace. When a believer falls from grace in this context, it's driven off course to fall into legalism. Most believers get separated from God because why? How can you get separated? And I think a big reason is they stop talking to dad. Stop that prayer time. I mean, you start drifting away. You start uh, filling in the blanks with something else. It takes a little effort. Oh, I thought you said I don't have to work. Well, relationships take a little work sometimes, right? You want to get up in the morning, talk with the Lord. Talk with him. Talk with our heavenly dad every day. Check in with him. Maybe learn a little more about him in this love story that he's written to us called the Bible. If you choose legalism, like these jokers were back in the day, if you start choosing legalism, well, you start giving up on grace as a way to relate to God. Okay? So we have this amazing way to relate to God. Are we going to try to work at it? Get those good deeds in every day? Light whatever we need to light? Pray through whatever we've got to pray through and just start chanting? Are we going to work? Are we going to just enjoy this relationship that God's given us? Enjoy the, the want to life of, man, Lord, I'm really geeking out on how much you love me. These are amazing stories of, of people that have relied on you to get them through the hardest of circumstances. I can't imagine what young David was going through when he faced the giant or any of the other troubles in his life. And they had God. And he had God's grace as a way to relate to him. Man, Lord, I want more grace. I want more of this curiosity for you. I want so much love that it's just like, okay, enough, stop. <laughs> you know, like, wow, you, you're really smothering me on this one, Lord. That's what I want from him. And, and he's like, man, just hold on. I'll open, up, I'll open up the door and let it flow out to you. I love you. You're my kid. I, I, I can't imagine trying to relate to God based on my own works because I'm not that hard of a worker. <laughs> like, I enjoy sleeping in sometimes. Like, but man, I go through grace, how he's set up the program, sign me up. We don't want to leave and move away from this grace standard, from this thank you life and want to life. We don't want to go to a works-based life. That does not sound fun at all. So we don't want to stop talking with him, reading about him, fellowshipping in with his people so we cut off that joy, that love, and that spiritual intimacy that, that um, grace has in store for us. For through the Spirit... He's telling these guys, through the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. There's another big term there. Righteousness. Perfect, perfect standing before God. No one is righteous, no, not one. What? You're kind of throwing curveballs tonight. I know, I'm just messing with you a little bit. So you're justified through faith. And through faith we have righteousness. We can't earn or work or merit perfect living before God. Well, then how do we get it? Well, ask Jesus. 
The Bible says, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift. There's a gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Righteousness is a gift through Jesus Christ. We we talked a lot about gifts going through Christmas, you remember? You can receive it, like, okay, thank you. Uh, Reject it, right? You can give it back. You can receive it, right, and look for the gift receipt so you can go to Kohl's later and take it back. Or you can receive it, open it, and apply it to your life. It's a gift. You choose to receive this. See, God's a gentleman. He doesn't force himself upon you. Oh, he'll get our attention, though, huh? But he doesn't force himself. It's by grace. And he offers us a choice. So Paul is confidently saying we have this hope of righteousness by faith. Like, I'm not living, like, this perfect life. If you guys started hanging out with me 24 hours a day, you'd be like, man, this guy's got issues. But by faith, I have righteousness. Thank you, Lord. And I can't be the only one whose life is like that. So believe in Jesus Christ. Believe and be confident in receiving his gifts of righteousness. Okay? It's a gift. We receive it. Welcome the gift. For in Christ, verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. He's like, Galatians, whether you've been circumcised or you're uncircumcised, 21st century reader, whether you worship on Saturday, Sunday morning, or you're here Sunday night partying with Pastor Rick, or you go to Monday night Bible study, or any other day, whether you're eating crab or lamb or double doubles or shrimp tacos or whatever it doesn't matter it has no impact on your relationship with the father the only thing that impacts your relationship with the father is jesus because he says i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me man that's cool thank you lord and he says but faith working through love i love this what's the saying But faith working through love. Your confidence working through love. You remember that saying, that do do what you love and you'll never have to work another day in your life? Isn't that a cool one? So faith working through love. The work for our salvation, it was already done. You don't have to work out your salvation. Jesus did that on the cross. In just a few months, We're going to have a big uh, resurrection weekend celebration here. I mean, because he's already done the work for us. We don't have to work up. We're supposed to have our faith working through love. Okay. As we're moving into the next set of verses, we're now going to see more about liberty and how it's got to be defended. Okay, so verse 7, you ran well. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who's getting in your way? You're doing so good. It literally says, who hindered you? If you, if you direct translate, it says, who tripped you up? Who tripped you? Paul, when he uses things like running or fighting the good fight, he has a, I think Paul was a sports guy. He talked about the Olympic Games a lot. And so when I think about this, you ran well, you, who hindered you from obeying the truth? One of, like, my favorite, like, modern historical heroes, and they did movies about this guy about 10 years ago. You guys heard of Louis Zamperini? Yeah, yeah, he's super awesome. He was, like, he's an Olympian. He was a USC track star. He was called the Torrance Tornado. Like, this guy was amazing, okay? And so I'm going to share something he wrote in his autobiography, and, uh, oh, he had a movie called Unbroken. There was a couple of movies about his life, but there's some great documentaries about him too. So he talks about you ran well, who hindered you? So Paul has runners, he has these Olympians in, in his mind. 
Check out what happened to Louis Zamperini about hindering him. Like, who's messing with you? He says here, the Torrance Tornado. Oh, by the way, the biggest thing, that one of the things he's known for is he was a World War II uh, POW, and he survived. Crazy story. So he shares this. He says, it talks about a race he had. So the runners had boxed me in. One slammed his shoe into my foot, driving the spike into it, ripping my shoe. And then he goes on to say, one slammed his shoe into my foot. Oh, I already read that part, sorry. So he goes, this runner in front of him, because he was getting boxed in, the runner in front of him kicked him back with his spike, cutting his shins. The third runner elbowed him so hard it cracked his ribs. So Paul kind of, I think Paul kind of has this stuff in mind. I didn't know track could be so, like, brutal. I just thought, it's not for me because of all the running. But these guys really, like, get into it. And Paul's like, you guys were running so well. Who's hindered you and boxed you in? Who's doing this to you guys? What's the obstacle between us right now and us enjoying this relationship with the Lord? What's restraining us from just obeying his truths right now? What's hindering our walk, our relationship with the Lord? Well, I can't fix that, okay? Those are just questions for you to answer. No, Jesus can help. And it's hard sometimes when you're in this waiting phase. Uh, Andrew and I were talking about this earlier. One of, the, one of the hard parts that I have is when I'm stuck in seasons of like, I don't know what to do, Lord. I just want to fix stuff. That's what I like to do. I like to get called in and fix stuff around here. But what about when you just have to wait on the Lord? Like, that's hard. And that's where God's grace comes in. Or you're just, Lord, I need more. And maybe you have to pray that 50 times a day. Lord, I need more of your grace. Help me to see your grace. Help me to feel it. Help me to, to apply it to my life. Help me, Lord. Keep crying out to him. God's not leaving you alone. He loves you. You're his precious kids. He's got this grace relationship with you. He loves you. You're important to him. Don't let Satan box you in, drive spikes through your feet and cracking on your ribs, man, call on the Lord. He absolutely loves you. He thinks you're important. You're his kid. He says here in verse, we're going to take verses eight and nine right now. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. And then he goes on to say a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. Small things definitely have a big impact, can't they? Over Christmas, my mom taught me how to make tortillas. Oh my gosh. She taught me how to make her famous vanishing tortillas. Because if you have two little Cornejo girls in your household, they vanish. You can't even, as soon as they come off, they just want to snag them. And, well, why, why do you mention tortillas? Well, tortillas are flat. Why? No leaven. So you know what I've been doing lately? I learned how to make pizza dough. I was telling the guys. So pizza dough, you throw some leaven in it, a little bit, like just a little, like half an ounce in this, like in the mix, and it starts rising. I mentioned the tortillas because I found that while my dough is rising over the hour or so I wait, I make tortillas. A little leaven makes a huge impact. So, so what I'm trying to say is these jokers going in there spreading this mess about, hey, you got to start working it up. Just start working. That little bit starts impacting the like, whole community. And Paul's trying to like say no, guys. And that's how sin works. A little like couple of seconds of sin impacts a lot. But man, I was we were reading Psalm 38 earlier this morning when I opened up the services for Pastor Eddie. He had me read Psalm 38. And it talks about, man, I'm so burdened down, Lord, in those first few verses. But and we were praying together as a church. And as we were praying together, we said, but it's not too burdensome for the Lord. You, we might be heavy laden, but it's not heavy for the Lord. The heaviest things that we're going through, the Lord's like, come here. The, the Lord is yoked, and he can lift that up from us and heal us. He's a big God. So when these little things that have a huge impact, oh my gosh, the Lord can totally course correct that. Bring him into the situation. Verse 10 says, I have confidence in you. Paul's saying this. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, 
that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Well, now Paul's like taking the gloves off. He's defending this liberty, and he's getting ready to start attacking and sharing his points of view on these Judaizers, these guys who are trying to make Jews out of these Christians, okay? He's trying to say this. He goes, man, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. So what he's saying is, I have confidence in you, okay? Let's start with that part of the verse. He says, despite how bad things look, I like that Paul still has some optimism, and he lets his readers know that he's that he thinks that they are not going to accept any other view but the true view, God's view about grace, the right view. He's confident that the Galatians would accept God's view of, remember that word justification, just as if I'd never sinned? He says, I know it. I know you guys have it in you that you're going to accept God's view of justification and sanctification by grace, okay? He's confident. But Paul also says, I love that. Paul's like a dude's dude. You're messing with my stuff? Here we go. You're going to mess with my flock? Well, you guys are going to get judgment, whoever you are. And, I, and it made me think about um, what Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 6 through 7, he goes, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That was Jesus saying that. Jesus said that. It would be better for him if a millstone hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. As you guys know, I'm no scientist, but I work for one. And he totally looks up cool illustrations like the one I'm about to share. Do you know what happens if a millstone were hung around someone's neck and they were thrown in water? Jesus does. I think he knew exactly what he was saying. The pressure, I'm going to read this to you so I don't mess it up. The pressure from the water would push in on a person's body, causing any space that's filled with air to collapse. The air would be compressed, so the lungs would collapse. At the same time, the pressure from the water would push water into the mouth, filling the lungs back up again with water instead of air. Uh, I think Jesus knew that. You mess with my kids and cause them to sin. It's better that someone got a millstone, hung it around your neck, and threw you into the ocean. And Paul is like, the gloves are coming off. Don't lead my flock astray, whoever you are out there. And I, brethren, he's like, guys, if I still preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. So he's making it clear that I am no longer preaching the necessity of circumcision. There's no more steps outside of belief in Jesus Christ. He's saying, I don't preach that anymore. If I did preach that, then why am I still being persecuted? No one would be offended if I said all that and agreed with him. No one would be getting after me. They'd all be my, my friends and stuff. But instead, he preaches belief in Jesus Christ. That there's liberty in Jesus. There's freedom in Jesus. I mean, we see that the fact is the cross is offensive to the religious person because he wants to get in on the action. The religious person wants to get in on, I got to work out my own salvation. And Paul's like, dude, there's no room for you to do that. It's already done. Jesus is dying. Jesus dying on the cross was a way to say, you can't save yourself. I must die in your place or you have no hope at all. That's what Jesus dying on the cross said. You can't do it. I have to do it. I did do it or else you would have no hope at all. Let's not take anything away from the cross. I could wish. Okay, here's Paul getting ready to throw some more blows here. Verse 12. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. He's like, you know what? Those guys who think circumcision is so important, then they need to complete the operation themselves. I'll let you fill in the blanks on that. Verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, 
but through love serve one another. Don't use this freedom to just be an excuse to do whatever you want. No, don't do that. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows, by loving one another and serving one another. When Pastor Ed taught this verse, he said this, Jesus promised to set us free. He never promised to make us independent from him. Do you guys see that? So he gives us liberty, but it's not a liberty to just like do whatever we wanted, okay? He gives us liberty, but like Pastor Ed, when I heard him teach us, he says, Jesus promised to set us free, which he did. He promised to set us free, but he never promised to make us independent from him. Biblical freedom from illegitimate is, excuse me, let me read this to you. Biblical freedom is freedom from illegitimate bondages. So we can fully enjoy our relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're free, we're set free, but we're set free so that we can just fully, without any exhausting work, just enjoy this relationship that Jesus has for us. We just receive his gifts. Oh, as you know, there's boundaries, right, with this freedom. He says, don't just use your freedom to do whatever you want. Serve one another with love. The boundaries are healthy boundaries. So we can enjoy. So we can, like, succeed and progress. Man, Super Bowl last week, right? I'm not a football guy. I've told you guys that. I'm not a football guy but I know if you want to if you get that ball you those guys are free to run within the sidelines down to the end zone right I'm a baseball guy you're free to hit that ball as hard as you want as long as it's not out of the foul lines right as long as it's within those foul poles we're free I think God allows some of these healthy boundaries for us to create this opportunity for us to take full advantage for us to go out there and swing, for us to go out there and run, for us to go out there and just live like crazy for him. He does set some boundaries. He makes the rules simple. Love me, he says, with all you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. How easy is that? Love. We're almost finishing up here. So here we got, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, verse 14, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, if you don't recall, it comes from when Jesus was asked. These guys are asking him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him back in Matthew 22, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Those 613 laws, those thousands of oral traditions in the Talmud, everything fulfilled by love, by love. And the opposite's kind of true. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Man, so you don't want to love your neighbor as yourself? Well, then enjoy being bit and consumed. I've actually never done this illustration, but has anybody ever cooked a pot of crabs? I've never done it, but I YouTubed it just so I knew what I was talking about. YouTube makes you experts. I watch these like guys cook these crabs. You know what crabs do? The water temps start, like if they're in the pot, you have a whole bunch of crabs. They start boiling and the water starts rising. The crabs start crawling over each other. Right once one of them gets out, a crab claw comes up and takes them back down. Then the other one goes up and they keep, they like boil themselves because they're trying to get after each other. And I don't want to live that type of life. I'd rather just love my neighbor as myself. But there's liberty in Christ. That was the point of tonight's message. There's liberty in Christ. Before I was, uh, I got on staff here, some of my previous employment experiences left me with a lot of trauma and I would sometimes go into these like guilty, like weird things where my mind would just like 
rip my, me to shreds via my emotions and I would, I would just start freaking out all of a sudden. And, I, and it happened for several months in a row where I'd get these like bouts of like stress, this traumatic stress. And I would watch online, Greg on Sunday nights, he would say, there's liberty in Christ. There's liberty in Christ. And I heard him say it for weeks. And I remember one night I was sitting at home and this was when I was in seminary. I was watching him and I was going through this type of, I guess, an attack. And I was by myself in our dining room at our house in Crestline. And, and I was like freaking out. And I didn't hear any of the message, but I heard there's liberty in Christ. Christ has set you free. And all of a sudden, it was the Holy Spirit, like a Holy Spirit moment happened. And it's like, bam, like chains fell off of my chest, just allowing me to breathe. I've never had an attack like that again. And I wish I could duplicate it for you. And all I can say is there really is liberty in Jesus Christ. He will free us. He does free us. He did free us from sin. He will help you with depression and anxiety and anything else that's causing trauma in your life. Jesus is the answer. And if you're not experiencing that, Jesus is the reason for your praise, you know? Praise him because he's healed and worked in your life. It was not through works. It's not that I just worked myself into like a healing. No way. It was the Holy Spirit. And it was like finally getting through. Like, yes, I heard it, right? Yeah. Faith will come by the hearing, the hearing of the word of Christ, our word of God, right? Romans uh, 10, 17. That's our sound guys' is a, a ministry verse. I have it, like on, when I have my departments, I have sound guys. And they, uh, faith comes by hearing for our sound team. And that's what was happening. I was hearing it, and it finally went through my thick head, down into my heart, and caused trust into the Lord. And I was able to receive that peace that he offered. There is liberty in Christ. He came not to condemn the world, but to, that the world through him would be saved. That's what John 3.17 says. It's always overshadowed by the famous John 3.16. But Jesus came to save, not to condemn. Sign me up. Like we read last week, he asks Martha. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I don't know if I read that here at my Thursday night Bible study, but Jesus tells Martha when he's raising Lazarus, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And then he says, Martha, do you believe? And that's a question, like, we need to answer. Do you believe? And if you say yes, praise God. And if you're like, man, I'm on the fence, but I feel the Holy Spirit is tugging on me right now, then we want to pray for you. We pray this prayer every week because, man, we don't want to leave anybody out of heaven. We want that place to be packed. And it's a prayer that goes like this. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your truth, God, that, that is liberating, Lord, that's freeing, God. Thank you that we don't have to work. It's not based on our performance, but on your promises. Thank you for demonstrating your love for us, that while we were still sinners, you gave your life for us, Jesus. So, Father, I pray that while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, that if there's someone here that wants to know that their sins are forgiven, if there's someone in here that wants to know where they'll spend eternity, then we would like to pray with you. You can pray out loud with us, or you can say it in the intimacy of your own heart between you and the Lord. And the prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can serve you from this day forward. And all of God's kids agreed by saying, Amen. Church, there's liberty in Christ. God bless you guys. If no one's told you that they love you, church, I love you guys. God bless you. Good night.